Hello, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Kristen Whiteside, and I'm speaking to you from San Diego, California in the United States. Welcome to this IPA webinar entitled Psychoanalytic Approaches to Addiction. Analysts may feel hopeless in their ability to help a patient who suffers from addictions. Indeed, patients who engage in compulsive, addictive behaviors can make us uncomfortable, and we must bear the prolonged and challenging periods of not knowing how to reach such patients. However, today we're going to discuss what the psychoanalyst has to offer a patient beyond treatment of their symptoms and how we can help these patients search for the source of their pain. A psychoanalytic perspective on addictions recognizes that the problem began well before the addiction symptoms emerged. In collaboration with our colleagues who treat symptoms and reduce suffering, uh, we can control to do an in approach to these problems. So today we're going to meet three panelists who are members of an IPA subcommittee on addictions. And we're going to think together about the origins of the symptom of addictive behaviors. We're going to hear some examples of their clinical work. And we invite you to submit your questions about this perspective on addictions. We have three panelists, um, an interregional panel of analysts, Jose Susman from Rio de Janeiro, Marina Lukomskaya from Paris, and Mark Wallace of San Francisco. Following their individual presentations, we'll have a brief panel discussion and then we will conclude with 30 minutes of questions from the audience at the, at the end of the program. So you'll submit your questions in the chat box located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. And we'll begin with um, an introduction of our first speaker. Dr. Marina Lukomskaya is a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. Dr. Lukomskaya is a training analyst of the Paris Psychoanalytical Society. Born in Moscow, she worked on dependency problems at the National Research Center and represented Russia as the World Health Organization advisor in the context of international alcohol and drug-related studies. Since 1993, Dr. Lukomskaya lives and works in Paris. She is involved in the development of a psychoanalytical approach in the community mental health institutions and drug treatment centers in Paris. She's invited regularly to teach in the European Psychoanalytical Institute and in training seminars of the IPA. She published a monograph entitled Alcoholism in Russia, Social, Psychological, and Clinical Study as well as a number of articles in French, English, Russian, and other languages. Welcome, Dr. Lukomskaya. For this presentation, uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude, thanks for organization of this meeting, inviting me to speak to you today and it is an honor to participate in this first open discussion between psychoanalysts and for psychoanalysts about the problem of addiction. In order to better understand the place of psychoanalysis in the treatment of addicts, uh, it is important to keep in mind uh, the biological, social, and the 
psychological uh, aspect of the problem of drug addiction. Only working in this uh, multidisciplinary team, we can handle the heavy drug addict uh, to cope with their withdrawal syndrome, to manage their uh, severe social disorders, disintegration, to cope with their psychological vulnerability. Now, many new forms of uh, uh, addiction thoroughly described in an uncontrolled behavior for electronic games, uh, such uh, as uh, internal addiction, smartphone addiction, sexual addiction. What common between these new forms of uh, psychic intoxication of different with different objects and the old one with the intoxication and drunkenness by the substances. What can introduce psychoanalysis in the general understanding of addiction? It is uh, important to keep in mind that uh, the dependency. It is a very old human quality. It is existential. Uh, existential um, uh, quality, which is not pathological. Uh, I know that uh, Jose Zuzman is going to speak uh, largely on this topic. I just want to mention that uh, psychoanalysts looking for the meaning of pathological dependency. And he is trying to understand what is it, why it is, why it was constructed, this symptom. It may be a tentative to avoid the reality, to create a kind of a substitutional object when the, when the love is inaccessible. Uh, the construction of the ill, uh, addiction symptom can be seen like a wrong way of management of drives. Analysts try to understand, uh, understand the pleasure and the suffer of person who invest the his vital energy, his libido energy, in this kind of transitional object. What happens in a previous life and why the ordinary human development was broken, blocked from the human being? Sometimes we can find a real traumatic event in uh, the history of the patient. But very often it is situated in uh, just in his childhood and in the kind of relationship between the parents, between the mother and the child. And uh, this is very important for the future development of the person, this object relation, the relation of the primary important object of the life of the baby. On the one hand, it may be a depressed mother with distant incapacity to bring to this child a uh, feeling of life, feeling of security. But on the other hand, it may be hyper uh, careful mother, dominating mother, anxious mother which has no this ability of separation and the natural dependency of the baby of the baby to his primary object it has no issue and pathological differences develop always often in adolescence the relationship in the couple of parents the father attitude, sexual restriction, uh, can be very traumatic for a young person and provoke different deviations. 
In psychoanalytical therapy, we try to find the basic conflict of the person. And um, often addicts have no memory of their child, childhood. Uh, one of my patients told that before 14 years, she is just a, a black hole, no memories at all. And then she gone away from the house. And analyst with a psychoanalytical approach and psychoanalytical method have possibility to work with unconsciousness of the person, with forgotten things which are not really forgotten. And uh, uh, our tools like free associations and uh, of course, uh, interpretation of dreams. It is a very specific method of psychoanalytical work. He uh, brings the uh, entrance to the childhood memories, the old traumatic events, and uh, gives the possibilities to metabolize them, to work with this young early traumatism. During the therapy with the patient, we do reconstruction of his history. And uh, uh, it is the first step for elaboration and uh, reconstruction. Uh, I would like to note that it is possible in the context of the positive transference to analyst. It is just a new uh, experience of new model of relationship with another person. And on the basis of this new model, the addict uh, progressively developed a capacity to, to communicate with other people in another way. The psychoanalytical treatment requires from analyst a lot of competency. And uh, uh, in the beginning, it is necessary to work with negative transference and negative counter transference. A long time because uh, it is possible to create the real relations with confidence. It is a long way when a patient with incapacities, uh, with tendency to acting and not thinking, uh, begin to develop a knowledge of another functioning. During this work with analyst, he begin to think. And especially, he begins to have a pleasure of thinking, not avoiding of to acting, but a pleasure of thinking. The patient discover uh, emotions which were repressed, and he shares them with the enemy. And finally, he wonders why I am like that. And from this point, the real psychoanalytical work begins. So I want to know that it analyzes without coach. It is a special form of analysis, of analysis which we do with the addict patient. And it has to be adapted to different stage of the development of the process of addiction disease and the process of psychoanalytical work. And the first steps of this work analyst have to develop the competence in behavioral treatment, in rational cognitive treatment. And only after some time, when patient is prepared to bring the dreams to product 
to the dreaming world, the psychoanalytical in profound world can be developed. So I would like to know the psychoanalytical process, uh, process which brings uh, to uh, the changes in the personal and the edic identity. It's very long, but in my opinion, it is the only guarantee from the new relapse to addiction. I think it is just a basic thing which uh, can uh, uh, begin the discussion. And maybe in your questions, I can uh, speak uh, in other things here, yeah, maybe about some examples. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lukanskaya. And now we are going to hear from Jose Sussman. Jose Sussman is a full member and professor at the Rio de Janeiro Psychoanalytic Society in Brazil. He's chair of the IPA Subcommittee on Addiction uh, he holds a postdoctorate in addiction made in partnership between the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and Harvard University. Um, he um, mentored by Professor Antonio Nardi and Professor Edward Kantian of Harvard Medical School. He holds a PhD in psychoanalysis mentored by Ustaco Nunez, master's degree in psychiatry mentored by Dr. Nunez, and he is a professor of psychoanalytic psychotherapy at the Psychiatric Residency Program at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Welcome, Dr. Sussman. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, some of the people, Virginia Unger, IPA, IPA President, Sergio Nick, Vice President, uh, Sylvia Weinberg, which is the chair of this webinar committee, and a special thanks to Anna Paiva, which is an IPA membership services secretary for Latin America. It's always helping us a lot. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Um, it's a special moment for us. We, we are a, a new subcommittee. Uh, we're not we're not very small. This uh, has attracted a lot of attention, and now we're being able to talk with the world. But let's start. Um, first, uh, I think we we have a problem when we think psychoanalytically about addiction. Uh, we have many. I'll try to talk about some of them. Uh, first of them is that we use terms that are not appropriate. Like we link uh, addiction to dependency. Like they were the same thing and when they're not. They're not. Uh, we all as a species are dependent. And uh, potentially we are addicted. Uh, and those are two ways, separate ways, then connect to themselves. Um, independence, on the other hand, which is so uh, valuable for our culture, uh, doesn't exist. Uh, Winnicott said once, in one of his books that we found an independent person, that person probably would be uh, at a mental health clinic surrounded by nurses. So it's uh, an attainable goal and uh, that has, bring us, uh, has brought us more disappointment than contentment. So we follow something that's impossible. We can reach some kind of autonomy and because of this autonomy, we can choose 
uh, to what we're going to be dependent on, or to whom we're going to be dependent on. Independence, in fact, is a reaction formation that uh, hides our fragility. Uh, and make us behave, uh, understand us the opposite way that we are, because we are dependent. So independence is a creation, it's cultural creation, and it's a reaction formation. Um, due to our fragility, we create a complex system to guarantee our survival, which is composed of two central axes. And then I'll make the division. One X is the axis of uh, dependency, and the other axis is the axis of addiction. Two different things. Uh, the action of dependency is the healthy one. It's not the one that gets us ill. It's the one that's more connected with uh, our abstract, abstract symbolic thinking, and it's, it leads to help. The uh, dependency axis on the opposite uh, is connected with the concrete thinking in the concrete world. Uh, it's connected with loneliness, uh, avoidance, uh, and suffering. But I, want to say, I don't want to say that addiction is always for the bad because we do normally use addictive resources when we need them. Uh, like when we feel uh, a great pain, emotional pain, we can recur uh, for an addiction disorder, like uh, addiction recourse, resources, like uh, we can go for a drink. We may say to ourselves, no, this is too much for me. I'll have to go for a drink. I can't take it. But we do that once, twice, three times, and then we take a shower and we move on. So addiction may have this good part that help us to uh, face difficult situations throughout life. Um, but it's very bad if we get stuck in the axis of addiction, because then we don't evolve. Uh, we, uh, we grow up because uh, it's part of our nature, but we don't develop because we are very far away from uh, our abstract world and our um, symbolic thinking and our feelings as well. So uh, it's like everyone every one of us and that that's it's a common place it, it's a, i'll make an analogy with the pool uh in a uh terrible day uh of heat so it's the unbearable hot and we see a pool we all dive in we all dive in because it's unbearable we need to dive in the one with more resources come back to the surface, uh, dry up, move clo change clothes and move on. The ones with less resources remain at the bottom. And get themselves lost there. They get happy that they don't have to face the heat. Uh, and think of that as paradise. Although, uh, on the long run, they may die because that's not proper for them. And this is our role as psychoanalysts. What can we do? At first, we, we have to know that this is a very difficult work. Uh, it's painful for the analyst to be objectified. It's painful for the patient to be humanized. This is kind of saying. Uh, but it's absolutely necessary. So we have to learn to work with colleagues, 
uh, because addiction brings a lot of problems like physicians, psychiatrists, nutritionists, phys physical educations, uh, professionals, uh, psychologists. But we have to know that our role is the role to dive deep into this swimming pool and to meet our patient at the bottom and run the risks of being there. And one way you have to know that you're getting close to that hostile environment is a feeling of boredom. Boredom is uh, it's a, quite a sign that tells us that uh, we are not interested in anything anymore. So when we close a patient and we feel sleepy and we feel bored and we can't think of anything to say, those are signs that you are at the addiction side of the world. Uh, and we as psychoanalysts should have uh, some intimacy to recognize that and help the patient to get closer to the dependence axis. Uh, for him for the first time to be able, how painful that may be, to use abstract symbolic thinking. So this is, uh, this is our role. Uh, we do that, it takes a lot of time, with a lot of dedication, it's, it's very painful to be treated as a thing, but with trust and love, we can try and establish a, a consistent relationship. And now uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quote Freud that in 1906 wrote a letter to Jung, Carl Jung, saying that in essence, psychoanalysis is a cure to love. And I would add, if I could, uh, it's a cure through love and trust. So our first step is to develop this love and trust. It's different from other treatments. We don't interpret the patient, we connect with the patient. As my uh, friend and old mentor would say, uh, the, the worst part is not to be suffering, the worst part is to be suffering alone. So we may be the only hope the patient has to, using the, 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 the poor analogy, to get back to the surface and get as far as we may. Uh, I think I've talked a lot, said too much, but uh, I just wanted to say at the end that everything that's been said here uh, will be published at the Psychoanalytic Study of the Child, which is a journal uh, that is uh, done by the uh, Columbia University and it will be released in March 21st. So everything I said here and much more will be already there and I'll have to, to end, I'd like, I'd like just to thank uh, uh, sorry I'd like just to thank my, my uh, editor there, uh, Laura Whitman, who helped me a lot, was very patient with me, and I think we did a, a good work together. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sussman. Um, and now we're going to hear from... Uh, and I wanted to congratulate you on, on the acceptance of your publication. Um, we look forward to learning more. Um, next, we're going to hear from Mark Wallace. Mark Wallace is a graduate analyst and on the faculty of the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis, where he's also the chair of admissions 
for the Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy Program. He is a member of the IPA Subcommittee on Addiction and clinical faculty at the California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco, where he teaches and consults on integrative psychoanalytic approaches to addictive disorders. He's in private practice in San Francisco and Marin County, California, treating adolescents, couples, and adults. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to share my thoughts today and wanted to thank Jose very much and, and also the IPA for hosting this panel. Um, it, it's a real honor to be here. So as my colleagues have, have um, already sketched out, you know, of course, this topic of addictions is, is enormous and vast, and there's so many different theoretical formulations and treatment approaches we could discuss. Um, I'll focus on a few key features and, and share a little clinical material um, to, to add to what my colleagues have already shared. So effective clinical work with people with substance use disorders, and when I say substance use disorders, I, I mean also to, to include process addictions too. Um, but, but as Jose has been pointing out, the defining of terms in this area is very complicated and quite important. Um, but in the interests of time, I'll just ask that you understand it to mean all of the above. Um, and th this treatment requires stability in the analyst, flexibility, and even mobility on the port part of the analyst. It, it's important not to get preoccupied with ideas that practical help is somehow unanalytic. We really need to work with the patient to interrupt habitual addictive behaviors. This may include harm reduction work, education, medication approaches, consultation with family members, and connection to support groups, treatment programs, collaboration with other providers, and other resources. Through the caring provision of practical help to these patients, we may earn their trust over time, help them become safer in what they do, and create possibilities for deeper psychological growth than they may have imagined was possible or asked us to even begin to consider. It's what we bring that may inform the breadth of what's possible well beyond their their conscious thoughts and what they've known before. My esteemed colleague in California, Mitch Wilson, he, he speaks very eloquently about psychoanalysis through the metaphor of analyst as innkeeper. And I'd like to just borrow his imagery and remodel it for my own purposes here um, to discuss working with patients with substance use disorders. Um, my hope is to enliven and, and show in some visual way, like Jose's lovely analogy of the swimming pool, something of the activity of the analyst and different facets of, of what are involved. So if, if one is to think of having an analytic in with which to receive patients with addictive disorders, this in, it needs to provide an array of guest services, um, have a, a variety of procedures available to respond to the needs of its guests. And these need to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, not cookie cutter, but individually. Not all guests, can or will be treated the same in this inn, though they will all be respected. And this is crucial, particularly in this area. There, there is so much stigmatization and dehumanization in, in ways that patients with addictive disorders are, are themselves objectified. So all, all these guests will be respected. Each patient needs their own unique analyst, their own special relationship with the innkeeper. Substance use disorders, they, they occur actually at all levels of psychic functioning and across all character types. Some guests may walk into the lobby and freely tell you their life story as they unload so many suitcases. They look from the start like they intend to move in permanently. Patients with addictive disorders may also empty the mini bar without paying their bill, tear up the room, roam intoxicated through the halls, and may need special assistance and directions from the concierge. These guests, these patients though, uh, they're 
They're by degrees unaware of or overwhelmed by their feelings, preoccupied with secret rituals of comfort and dissociation. They may be ashamed of their secret goings on, though they may have some inkling that they need the innkeeper's help. They may need us to provide not only a warm place to rest and be known, but they may actually need us to introduce them to these parts of themselves, all the while providing a safe and stable analytic in. I think of Winnicott putting his disruptive young guest outside during a fit of his own hateful countertransference. It's crucial to know one's limits to have house rules, but to be fully collaborative with those who can make good use of the innkeeper and even to warmly seek out to go find and enliven some of those guests who might otherwise withdraw and wither away alone in their room. perhaps not unlike at the bottom of, of Jose's pool. Why do I emphasize this taking an active stance? Well, by definition, as Marina pointed out, many of these patients are so action prone that they need us to respond in action, not only in the way of provision and stabilization, but as a form of interpretation that behind our action, we're saying things symbolically. Sometimes our words simply aren't enough. They may need us to say yes in action to accepting them as they are, while ultimately saying no to aspects of what they do, to show that we can imagine their addictive exploits when they aren't with us, that we want to know the self-state of the patient who uses not just a compliant and abstinent version of themselves. We want them to be able to introduce us to who they are before they use, when they're using, to allow themselves and us to connect with these dissociated parts of themselves. More still, it's not enough to stay home and inhabit this inn. The analyst needs to be flexible within the confines of the inn, but also mobile. Patients with addictive disorders may need us metaphorically to leave the safety of our office and figuratively join them on the road to travel with them and allow them to lead the way. We want to know and understand where they've been, how they travel, and what more they need. These things we can't come to know if, if we remain settled in rigid or dogmatic analytic ends. We may need to bend the frame to really know them fully. Our patients can't know the, the curiosity in us and our visions for their travels. If, if they think of us as parochial and experience us as insular and unwilling to, to open up to them and the world outside. So we can gradually interest patients in the growth and possibility that exist outside of their habitual ways of clinging to part objects and overused rituals. With too much time on this figurative road, the innkeeper becomes exhausted, however, disoriented. The inn becomes neglected as do the other guests. We have our limits and each of us needs to find and protect our inn and ourselves and not succumb to our own omnipotent fantasies of completely rescuing such patients from themselves. I'm not suggesting that we can become everything to every patient, but flexibility and activity are, are, are really quite crucial, I think. So before closing, I'll just, I'll share a clinical example here. This vignette portrays um, just one among a huge variety of patients with substance use disorders. The variety I think is quite important. The addiction's not singular or monolithic, and those patients who present with this really come from all walks of life and, and have many different organizations. Some of these folks have had disappointing or even tragic outcomes, while many have made life-saving therapeutic changes and gone on to expand and enrich their life beyond what they had thought was possible. This particular exchange was with a patient some years ago, early in recovery, somewhere 
in the vast middle between the grip of addictive relating and the consolidation of post-addiction capacities. This excerpt highlights both the limitations in symbolic capacity frequently seen in more entrenched addictive disorders, along with a hope for future psychological growth. So this patient uh, with a long history of polysubstance use entered treatment shortly after committing to abstinence. Several months into her recovery, at the very end of an hour, she announced that she was planning to decrease her session frequency from three to one meeting per week. In our next meeting, at one point, I observed aloud how little I knew about her family, how much goes unsaid with her, I said. Without missing a beat, she replied, quote, actually, the things you think I might say go unthought. Among my replies, I, I say that while she's made very important progress in controlling her alcohol and drug use, there's much work to be done, I think, in knowing herself, becoming known by another, but most of all, in, in a richness that may be possible throughout her life that I, I don't think she's conceived of. I say that I was actually thinking we ought to meet more often. She goes on to say the following, not having to put into words, not having to translate my thoughts and feelings so someone can understand, that's how I've handled things. It's hard for me to translate. I don't have some of the vocabulary, even to myself. It's not about nameable feelings, it's just pure feeling. If I slow it down, I can sometimes find the words. It was almost easier though to have a physical feeling instead. And then I would use a chemical to feel less or to amplify it. I don't wanna let things pass naturally. I don't want to do the work. My co-presenters and I all share an interest in these relational processes which can find and awaken the areas of psychic stagnation that inhibit psychological growth. Exploration of the early life of patients with addictive disorders, it tends to reveal environments not necessarily frankly traumatic, where there's a big overt capital T trauma that we find, though one does see such soul murdered patients with addictive disorders as well. We can think more of these patients as having environmental experiences along with biological and social factors that have impinged upon their growth. The development of self-regulatory and relational capacities has become stunted and they have retreated from a not good enough or traumatizing environment toward an addictive object. This process may not reveal itself fully until adolescence or even later in life when circumstances trigger a pronounced need for this withdrawal into the self. I think of the addictive object as a failed transitional object, semi-autistic and tied up with omnipotent defenses. It serves a variety of needs for psychic equilibrium and survival. The addictive object is fundamentally opposed to interdependence. Somewhat different language, but, but I think analogous or synonymous perhaps to what Jose was saying. We can talk later about some of the subtle distinctions perhaps, but opposed to interdependence. Through affective attunement and active analytic inquiry, the analyst can reawaken the patient's capacity to relate to their own experience. So I told my patient, I noticed that when I asked about her feelings and the absence of information about her, that she was actually immediately capable of clearly saying and, and articulating what, quite well, I thought, how parts of the addictive process work within her. When we slow down, I see that she can find some of the words. In the shared space between us, the words are thought and spoken. She says, quote, it used to be, I'd feel bad, I'd have a drink, then I'd feel bad about that and have a drink and on and on. It was the only way I knew how to fix these feelings. 
I've done some things I'm not proud of, but I think I'm becoming less harmful and less self-harming than before. So by actively seeking out and collaborating with the patient, we can slow down these habitual manic defenses and interrupt the dead end love affair with the internal addictive object. These pauses shaped together with the, the analyst create an analytic time and space in which possibilities exist and hopes emerge. In this space, worn out, knee-jerk habits slow down, impulses can be delayed, emotions felt, and experience reorganized and recognized. Together with the patient, we create new forms of self-regulation, thinking, symbolizing, and growth in human relatedness. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for your wonderful illustration of, um, of how we as, as psychoanalysts can, can help patients uh, regain this connection to themselves and regain an experience or develop a spirit, an experience, a tolerance of um, interdependence. Um, so I'd like to open up um, just to the panel um, an opportunity to discuss your responses to one another um, and to think together about uh, how analysts um, can help our patients with addictions to, um, to plumb the depths, to go there with them, but also to um, help them to return to the surface, to use Jose's metaphor. Thank you. Well, let me start. Uh, both Mark and Marina. Uh, what do you do when you feel the discomfort of being uh, beside an addicted patient and not being able to get to him or her uh, when you're being uh, objectified and you have nothing, you, you, suddenly nothing comes to your mind to stop thinking uh, because it's very painful to treat uh, an addict because we ourselves try to protect ourselves as Mark said uh, of some addiction matters I said that we recur to addictive resources when faced by pain and we know that at some time we have to give it up but doesn't it attract us somehow in such a way that when an addict patient comes to us with this uh, idea of paradise which is which is wrong it's a dying paradise but doesn't it touches us at some place does it bring any discomfort? What do we do to yeah. handle that and to help the patient uh, see uh, um, the view of, from the dependent axis angle so that he can uh, be with us, join us and walk along with us? I can begin. It is a very important question today. And I remember when I was walking, I was walking in the drug treatment center. At the first interview with Eddie, something touched me profound when the person at the end of the uh, first interview told me it is the first time with 
when I was speaking like a vet, when I was speaking about me and somebody was listening. In the beginning, it was surprising that people question told me that it is our first meeting, the first experience of human relationship, human exchange. And uh, it touched me and it gave me understanding how it is important to create with this population of patients, human relations. Of course, it is not a psychoanalytical approach in Pope or some, but it is the first contact which uh, make me interested in this person and uh, give me the um, feeling I can't help him. I have to help him. One of my patients, you mentioned the uh, good part of addiction. I was thinking about it because there is some good part of addiction. My patient with a heavy, very heavy uh, uh, heroin addict told me that heroin saved her life from the suicide. Because the first injection proposed by her friend gave her a kind of satisfaction, she continued to live. Then, unfortunately, she became very rapidly dependent on heroin, but she was not dying. So good part, yes, of course, uh, drugs bring a satisfaction. And uh, another non-drug addiction brings some satisfaction. It is management of drugs, not to be explored of aggressive behavior or psychosomatic problem. It is a kind of construction, the addiction behavior. And uh, in a general, we can understand the sense of this construction of these symptoms to avoid the worst thing. The, shall I respond? Sure. Is it very great? I, I really appreciate your question. And uh, th there's a way that outside of psychoanalysis, many who uh, work in an integrative way on addictions think about having an incrementalist approach where you don't expect everything to happen all at once, but where you're, you're really looking to slowly warm something up and go with what's available, try to enhance motivation and to, to see where that momentum can go. And I think there's a way that applies to our work too, that it's useful to have an idea that maybe only very incrementally and non-linearly, you know, it goes up and down that, that we may be experienced um, less as, as a thing in this way with the patient and more as a person, but, but to, to find ways to manage our own investment in being important such that, that we don't act out our own countertransference urgency to be important and central in some way, but that we, we can tolerate being peripheral in some ways, tolerate being maybe even um, f feeling rather helpless or, or peripheral. It, it brings back memories for me of working before analytic training, before graduate school with street youth uh, street Youth in Seattle in, on an HIV prevention program and approaching youth on the street, um, many of whom are 
engaged in all kinds of risky acts and just hoping maybe we can have some conversation. Uh, maybe there's some concrete need they have that I can be of help to provide or refer them to. Maybe we'll even talk about risk reduction. Maybe over time, they'll see that I'm someone who's around that they can tolerate is safe enough and, and maybe can even imagine getting something more from. Um, there's a, it's a very incrementalist, modest sort of idea, uh, but one doesn't typically expect this in analysis, you know, when it's a dyadic relationship and you're hoping, imagining that there'll be a centrality to how you're relating. Um, that, that's exciting for the analyst too. Uh, but Lisa Director writes, I think, quite beautifully about this in a, in a paper about this omnipotent and helpless arrangement that can flip back and forth and where the omnipotence in the patient and in their addictive process can leave the, the analyst feeling quite impotent or helpless for extended periods of time. And then it can flip where the analyst may have an omnipotent fantasy to rescue the patient who they, they see as helpless. So it, it, there, are, there are real counter-transference struggles to manage, but, but some of the incrementalism for me is helpful. Great. I think that's helpful, Mark, in, in helping us as analysts to think <clears throat> Um, in a more, as you said, in a more flexible way about this sort of presence that we provide that in itself is sort of a, we're responding to patients' actions with our own actions um, and being able to tolerate and meet the patient where they are and to provide any sort of human connection with them as a beginning um, is, is a perhaps uh, not felt to be rewarding by most analysts um, and perhaps is not valued enough as 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 a as an intervention but it is and in a way it's an it's an it's an action it's an intervention in action a nonverbal intervention um, for these patients so thank you I think it's interesting to think uh, that you have to recognize where you are, in what axis you are in. Like when feeling distant from the patient, sometimes when uh, you feel a pressure to fall asleep, or you feel uh, that you're not together, instead of uh, being so critical about this stuff is to know that you're walking along an addiction path. There's no other way to walk along an addiction path without that meaningless sensation, without the pressure for action, like the counter transfers pressuring us for an action. And that's an addictive response. And perhaps um, one of the, the most difficult parts in treating an addict is that, as I said before, we, we're all potentially addict, and normally we try to avoid this axis of addiction unless they are absolutely necessary. So when we feel that the, the addict is bringing to us uh, a, such a field that we have inside of us, that is that may, may be particularly difficult as uh, we may try to find a way not to escape from the patient only, but escape from a region inside ourselves we can't stand. So uh, if you feel as a counter-transference uh, that you're reacting or you're being pressured for action, uh, isn't it useful to try to put that in words, codify that, and share it with the patient.
finish my question. Some of the 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 challenges too, in ways that that reaches us, uh, that they come through differently. Um, th this is a little bit of a, a tangent, but um, now that so many of us are working remotely, near, nearly all or all of the time, um, th there used to be a question that was commonplace. You know, do, do you work with people who are actively using? And it seems that you know while there are variations that we all seem to embrace here on the panel, you know, that, that yes, you, you, you would work with someone who's, who still has some relationship and is, is engaged in drug and alcohol use, uh, some kind of addictive use of an object. Um, and then the question that often came up clinically was, but do you work with someone if they've recently used, um, if, they, if they're intoxicated and they come to your office? But, but now there, there are other questions too. This, just this week, uh, a student asked, um, yeah, but what do you do if a person is actually using um, during the session? And, you know, there are possibilities that we're, we're doing a home visit every time that we're, we're having an hour. We don't know what world we're, we're entering into and what we're seeing concretely, let alone, you know, the internal addictive objects we may be finding our patients relating to. But, but even concretely, there are all kinds of things that uh, we open ourselves to, and so this question about um, you know where where the the lines are for the box and how involved do we or don't we get they're they're even more complicated right now I think. I think it would be interesting to hear more about your experiences working remotely, just um, in in that sense of the. Um, the change in the frame and um, and these how, how these behaviors could could actually impact those interactions. Uh, I think that working remotely was not an option. It used to be, uh, and then it began something that was imposed on us because that was the only way to carry on with our treatments. Uh, and it changes a lot of the frame. Uh, I, I disagree with my colleagues who say that uh, it's more or less the same because it's not. Um, at the beginning, I got very tired because I had to pay so many so much attention to every slight emotion that appeared on my patient's face. Um, but gradually, gradually understood that the setting is uh, more or less equal to the, uh, to the bond we are capable to construct. So uh, we can be uh, in a space in between our house and our patient's house um, and live something together. Like when you go to a movie and uh, you, you're watching a movie and suddenly you don't know if you're sitting on your chair or you're making part of the movie because they, they mingle. They have to be mixed together, and when if the movie is good, of course, and when it finishes, it takes some time for the audience to to stand up and to to get back to the chair, because we weren't at the chair and we weren't at the movie. We were at some uh, new space. So that's what I think is what we get when we try we 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 are treating someone remotely. If it works, we, we get to uh, find some other space in between. Uh, it's very different because uh, we'll be seeing the intimacy of the patient. The patient will be seeing our intimacy. But this in-between space, that part, only that part, is more or less the same as it happens when you attend the patient in your consulting room. Because if it's a good session, 
you forget where you're sitting at, you forget about where your patient is sitting at, and you fly together. So it's more or less like that, I think. I think that it is extremely important question of the, I see that uh, our audience put this question also <laughs> about the frame and the limit of psychoanalytical tolerance to, to the frame of uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, setting face to face and analysis without coach seems to be a very important use in the work with addicts because of their incapacity to uh, to do the work on the coach, their um, risk to acting, uh, and capacity to be in a passive position on the coach, and the need to see the uh, real presence of the enemy. It is a part of uh, our treatment our communication, not only by the word, but our mimic, but our presence, but our whole being within our indication. So this setting, it is just a part of frame. But then the question of psychoanalytical rules, the hours, the days, the standard, which have been respected, and it seems to me that it is very important to walk edicts around these difficulties to keep the good frame in the walk because it is a question of distance with M. It is a problematic of the edict of dependency. He wants to be maybe uh, very close to us the analytical frame keep us in distance, then he don't want to come because he's angry, because he he wants uh, to show in this way his emotion. And again, that analytical frame permits us to discuss the problem of communication, to evolve something that he couldn't put in words. So, not to be too flexible in the psychoanalytical frame, and maybe to be flexible inside, respecting the incapacity of patient to think, to imagine, to bring dreams. We have to be flexible and accept it all about certain time, this incapacity. We have to help to think and uh, to look for the words which can explain uh, the feeling which is going to share with us. So we are flexible, we are not silent, we are not in intervention, psychoanalytical intervention uh, which can uh, shock the patient in the beginning. We are flexible inside this frame. Thank you. Um, we have some questions, uh, several questions related to um, efficacy of the psychoanalytic approach to addictions. Um, one of the questions is, does this approach work? In other words, do you achieve successful outcomes even in these very long protracted treatments? How do you measure? Um, how do you measure success um, with these patients and this type of work? Or are we talking about what sounds like an idealized idea of regaining or building an ideal um, object relationship with the analyst? So can can one of you start? addressing the question of efficacy? I think it varies tremendously in the same way that it does across all our practices with all patients. 
um, that addictive disorders, they're not a singular monolithic entity. They're, they're not all one and the same. So you could be working with someone who is very disorganized and dysregulated with a very chaotic relationship to any number of different addictive objects. Um, and, and we could call that working with addictions. We could also talk about you know, an executive who's functioning very well at work, has perhaps even a you know, flourishing personal and social life, but maybe privately, maybe in some ways that aren't just working for them, but are doing things to them that are problematic. They're relating to, to some object in an addictive way. But that, that would be a much more narrow addiction as I would think of it than something that's much more broad and much more disruptive in someone's life. So it's, it's difficult to generalize in terms of efficacy in that way because it, it, it really, we're talking about something that shows itself across all levels of psychic organization vertically and all character types horizontally. Um, but I do think you can see actually very gratifying and fast results sometimes in stabilizing some folks if you're not afraid to be flexible and work behaviorally. So there's an integrative component too that makes it challenging to think our psychoanalytic approach is effective. If you're working in a pluralistic integrative way, it, it may be more psychoanalytic in how you're formulating inside of yourself and how you're regulating your countertransference and in your visions for the future, while it might at the outset actually look to an observer more behavioral, some of the ways that you're engaging at the outset. I can add that Please. it is very important that every psychoanalyst who work in this field with addicts have maybe one or two very successful case. It is important to continue to work in this field, to keep in mind that this successful uh, case uh, which you can uh, tell to public and to, to your colleague and to keep in mind. Because you're convenient that it is possible. It is possible to get the real changes in a very disturbed person. And it is a great statistic. And to continue to work with uh, addicts, you need to have a lot of patience and a kind of anticipation. You can, you have to imagine uh, your patient in uh, several future years with the progress and it helps you to continue before the progress there is. Well, I think that a bit that fast. Uh, I think that we shouldn't idealize psychoanalysis as we shouldn't idealize addiction. Addiction is always an end product of several situations. So we talk about addiction as one thing, but it's not one thing, it's a whole of things. Uh, for example, uh, when we talk about addictions, the first thing that comes in mind is the addiction to drugs. And Mark uh, just remembered us uh, that there are other forms of addictions. And to be honest, if you think about behavioral addictions, Drug addiction, addiction is a minority of the cases, about 30% of the whole. When you think about sex addiction, work addiction, uh, addiction to exercises, addiction, you can get addicted to anything. Addiction is a kind of a relationship. It gets worse when you get addicted to a drug because the drug will have its effects on your body. And uh, you uh, increase your risk of dying and getting very ill 
but addiction is a relate it's a kind of a relationship that appears in several ways so we will never be able to have a good result with all patients but that is true of it to any patient we treat not the addicts and not about only psychoanalysis if you talk about medicine as a whole we talk of psychiatry uh, will help some and unfortunately not help others but we'll always try our best i think we have to begin with hope and go along with the patient until uh he's willing to go it's not what we think is good for the patient it's when the patient comes to us and says i'm much better uh this is good for me and so we have to let the patient go so it's not it's not in our hands to say uh, only in our hands to say you're good the patient will think that with us and say i'm fine with the, the development i've made so that's it it's a it's a, a, a joint uh, observation I wonder, Jose and panelists, if if this aspect of this sort of um, this sort of um, gray area of you know defining success, defining when a patient is ready to end treatment, I wonder if, in particular, with addictions, do you think that analysts, therapists, um, experience a particular kind of anxiety with these patients, where we feel that we have to cure them or or they have to reach a certain level of abstinence before we're willing to let them go as opposed to someone we're helping with i don't know an emotional disorder where yes the work is perhaps incomplete there's more work to be done but we could be perhaps um more willing to accept that is there something about this type of work that could um engender greater fear or anxiety in in analysts, in, in therapists? That's a very good question, Christian. And I do have to say that uh, our, uh, we work with anxieties, our patient anxieties and our self anxieties, but we cannot uh, hope that our patient get to a point that's impossible for him. Because we, if we do so, that's very harmful because the patient may get better and will be uh, expecting always something else. So uh, perhaps this patient has, as part of his history, uh, parents were never satisfied uh, with, uh, with his development. So he comes to the analyst and he finds an analyst who's never satisfied with his development as well. So if we go that way that means that uh, we got the wrong way we should hope for the best but we don't know what the best is and we have to listen and learn with our with our patients and if the patient says that he's good at least we have to uh, listen to him and ask him uh, what's your What's your idea of being good so that we can talk about it? But it's, it's a common decision. It's a common decision. Um, so we can never do our work without some kind of anxiety, but not the anxiety that our patient has to improve because this, this desire, this will has been more with the patient that with them with us we walk alone we we don't do it for the patient so we have to see what the patient needs and try to help him to get it but not do it for him so it's not in our hands to say when is enough it's on the patient's hand And, and to extend what Jose was saying about walking with, so, sometimes perhaps we're, we're walking in front, leading the way. Other times we're, we're letting the patient find their own way and, and leaving us behind maybe at the end in this way. 
Um, I think at the at the outset or throughout a treatment of this kind, life-threatening action that patients might take, of course, stimulate more panicky countertransference and and more developed um, rescue fantasies in the analyst. Um, but a patient whose use settles down, whose risks are less severe, um, probably satisfies some of the the wish to help, the, the, the wish to cure, and, and leave the analyst with less of this, this sense of responsibility for the patient's well-being. But these are counter-transference challenges to be managed, to be tolerated. At the same time, especially at the outset and then episodically, you know, what, one needs to gauge, well, what, what are the risks here? What, what level of safety or stabilization has this patient achieved? And what, what might some other appropriate interventions be, perhaps increase in frequency or change in a pharmacotherapy approach or move to a higher level of care as a recommendation. But, but it might often be the case that one can make recommendations, you know, like, um, like a waiter showing uh, a diner all of the, the items on the menu and I recommend this one, and this one's delicious too, or you, you, this is a more nutritious choice, but people are gonna make their own choices. So it's, it's I think of it as incumbent upon the clinician to be able to make the, these recommendations, but also to be able to tolerate uh, the limits of, of what we can do. Yes, the, the, there were, uh, a couple of questions from our audience about specific interventions and uh, for um, addiction. Um, for instance, one of the questions was, would you, uh, is psychoanalytic work the treatment of choice or is it better to refer a patient to a more hands-on DBT treatment? And there was another question about perhaps um, uh, in, uh, in, in the case of a family of patients diagnosed with addictive disorders, would you recommend an intervention with the family and not individual counseling? And I think that what you're saying um, about this sort of flexibility and uh, responsiveness and a, a, a development of a common um, understanding of with the patient about what what needs to be the next step or what would be helpful um, to that individual um, is it's probably a, a very um, idiosyncratic process um, there's not a there's not a road map for uh, leading patients down this road yeah. i think we can see the question of with families because it is a very important question what to do with family of uh, uh, addict. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're absent and we don't know where they are. The, every bonds are uh, interrupted. They lost their family, their, their um, brothers and sisters, and other person. So it is no problem with family. But uh, there are uh, some situations where family is very present. Mother is uh, absolutely anxious and want to know everything what happens in the center and especially what happens uh, in the sessions with analysts. What uh, analysts think about uh, her child, her baby. Uh, and uh, you feel the pathological relationship without separation with this dependency. Uh, which was created from the very small age. This child was, was always under his mother's uh, attention and she don't want to stop it. Even now when she be, became a, a, an adult addict and uh, do his treatment. So you understand the problematic of the dependency and you have managed it. In psychoanalytical work is most important, in my opinion, create the specific psychoanalytical space.
special space where persons can speak about everything and it rests here and never gone away. So this trust and confidence, the basic of our collaboration, can be disturbed by intervention of mother or another parent. I can tell no, it is impossible that I speak with your mother. It is impossible because our psychoanalytical work may permit me to speak with your friend. But I'm sure that it is very important that another person from treatment team psychiatrist, psychologist, uh, nursing, uh, admissional personnel can speak with me and can explain some points, some things, and can explain also the importance of distance between her and the team of treatment and who summons her uh, go. So uh, it is a, a very um, flexible situation. When I'm inflexible, I don't want to speak to parents, but I send them to my colleagues to do the very important work with the parents. And I protect by this the confidentiality with my patients. Yes, thank you. Clearly, we must work flexibly and collaboratively. It, it's a different role for a psychoanalyst. And we only have about two more minutes. We're going to end right on the half hour. But I think this is on everyone's minds. Could could one of you or say something briefly about the addiction to smartphones, YouTube, and the addictive element of addictive elements of social media, please? Oh, I like to. Um, uh, you too don't mind. Um, the uh, we're so dependent on love and social appreciation, then that the uh, this whole social social media system give us likes and tells us how many people saw our picture, a picture of ours, and if the picture is appreciated or not. And this this is so serious because uh, we, we this, this, this is the kind of thing that I said that uh, we use uh, addiction uh, strategies at times of uh, suffering but uh, we, that, that's an addiction uh, strategy. And I think at first the people who created that didn't know that, but they soon realized that it was important, surprisingly, for a person to be liked and loved and appreciated even by those uh, unknown people. So how many lives you get? is how much you're worth. So uh, this is a, a major problem because the social media, uh, the internet, all the apps, everything, it's, they're, they're fundamental for existence. We, we work with, uh, we're doing something fantastic here, being together uh, through this app, through the internet. That, that's wonderful. Uh, children are having classes during this pandemic uh, through the internet. It's fantastic. The point is that when um, we give the full power to the uh, uh, social media, to the internet uh, communication, so that we don't even have to know who is talking about us, that person is telling the truth. So if the person says that you're not well dressed, you don't know who the person is even, then you feel bad about it. 
think about changing your clothes or the person says that you your voice is not uh, uh, agreeable enough and you take it as a serious uh, uh, offense so especially for adolescents who are forming their identity adult identity to have people saying what they have to do and don't have to do is is to get is to get them at the position to be hooked at the addiction access and this is something we have to face uh, from now onwards I don't have answers but I know where they where, where the hook is the hook is that in, in the part that we are very dependent on love and self-recognition by, by ourselves and by the others. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. And thank you to our panelists. And thank you to everyone who attended and participated. Um, our upcoming webinar, the next will be Friday, the 23rd of October. Um, it is the PEC's project, the Meeting of Societies on Education, from oversight to collegial quality enhancement. Um, please plan to join us for the next webinar uh, at www.ipa.world. You can register for this webinar and watch uh, the recordings of previous webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. Oh, here.